That's called around AI. Also, put the um, I mentioned earlier that, that um, the session one there is a uh, is an additional panel um, on AI run by Scope, which we'll have back in the That will be in the library, the innovation room, the RFC, for those of you who are interested in the same, the campus, and the library. Okay? All right. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank our panelists for coming. Um, I recruited most of them over the past week, so you can imagine, um, you know, they, they're dragging into this, and I really appreciate it. That. And again, this is just to give us a kind of informal look at the way some people have been using AI. Hopefully, that gives you um, a sense of how you might be using AI in your work as well. And I also want to emphasize that also many of the conversations have heavily relied upon um, AI as a platform. AI is going to permeate everything that we do. So it is not just the fact that you should, the staff issue as well. As a staff member, I have looked at AI and been thinking about how AI impacts my work. And in fact, that AI tools are, are being embedded um, by major companies into what we use. Some of you might have seen uh, emails referring to uh, Microsoft Copilot. Copilot is a tool that is integrating into its email system. Uh, Google Docs has already integrated um, uh, AI tools. So there's simply no escaping it. So the first idea is for anyone to be aware of the AI tools that have always, already been embedded in the, in the tools they use, and then figure out what are the best ways to use it. Okay? Without further ado, I'm going to um, give a mic to um, our panel so they can introduce themselves, <coughs> and then I'm going to start with a very quick informal question. So I'll start with you. Um, so good to see all of you. Thank you today. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be part of this initial conversation. I'm Jim Gray here. I'm Jim for the ball here. Been here about 18 years, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, one of the things I think that when we start talking about this, I'm interested to hear from your panel is how we actually apply some of these things. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Roxanne McCorry. I'm the director of academic technology and distance learning, and I've been here about five years, and um, I'm excited to be on the panel too. Hey everyone, my name is Devin Wilson. I'm a professor of uh, CIS over at uh, ACC, and I've also been working with either both of Past over well, over a year now, um, working with AI pedagogy style, holding workshops here at NCC around AI. And happy to be joined on this panel with all of the other people there to share this great with AI. Yes, it's Jenny. Um, Jenny Bauer, Chair of Communication Partners on AI. Also, great. Hey, Krampus, I teach English here and form the help. Program. Also, happy to be here. So much happiness. Okay, I'm going to start with again, go down the road and, and ask each participant to briefly talk about, you know, how they how they integrated AI into their work, um, and then talk for a few minutes. I think you put me in the seat on purpose. Please, uh, thanks. Um, so the last year or so, the biggest thing I've been focusing on is how we can use AI um, to create and review materials, mostly OER. So um, we have a great program of OER here at Millsack. So if you hear um, some opportunities for grants, if you haven't got a chance, please feel free to communicate with other people about it. But, um, we have done a lot over the years where we started to crowdsource, and we did that with an introduction to this business a few years ago. And the students created this form. And the reason was there was no textbook. There's no textbook for that class in any sense. The industry changed so fast, and that was before COVID. Um, so we had students building things out um, and creating this as an OER document. So I started to say, well, how can I change this? Because I'm not going to learn it every stage, every time for the students. Um, so we started to look at AI and said, well, what can we do to revise this document? How can we update it? How can we use it as a resource or a search tool, essentially? Um, and I love a lot of the stuff that Charles said. One of the things was about hallucination, right? So how do we know this one is or how do we know that these things are actually accurate? So when we're doing that with AI, I've done this with a number of courses. I'm actually full-time now at um, Urban College of Boston. There are initiatives very similar to Middlesex. Um, but we're multilingual, so everything we teach 
features of English, Spanish, Mandarin, um, now Portuguese is being added, and so now she's real. We have students from all over the world now who are starting to come to us and use different languages. And so how can we create OERs uh, that are inclusive for the students, that are aware of language models, and that can actually be high quality content, so that when faculty are teaching them, that they can focus on, on the teaching side of it. Um, how can we design assessments? So there's a lot of areas here that um, the AI can help us with, but I would say it's not a panacea, right? It's not going to solve everything. It's going to be one of those issues where, as we, and we're still very much exploring this as we go through, um, how can we best define what they need to know the outcomes with the assessments and, and then help them? And the next step, I think, is going to be students using these tools to help generate that content. Because I also need to be aware of someone's background, their lived experience. Going into it, right? How do they best learn as people, etc.? I think mean, that's uh, the most exciting area for me. There's a lot to it, and please, I'll say this right up front: don't feel overwhelmed. It's okay. If you feel like that, it's all right. Like, this is new, right? I remember when we were all starting to learn Blackboard, right? Okay. Right? And this Blackboard is significantly not as complex as some of these word problems are. Not really, but so I'm not quite sure why I'm on this panel. That's that's <laughs> right so, but uh, so I'm very new into the exploratory area of you know looking at AI. I tend to fall on you know not jumping on technology right away. I want to see, but this one really interests me because uh, I think there's so much that it can do to help educators. So my work has kind of been that I've been working in is understanding AI prompts and how to, you know, um, you know, garbage in is garbage out, and it can do it in a very authoritarian way, which makes it seem like it's actually accurate, and that you might believe it. Um, recently, for example, there was an attorney who pulled cases from uh, AI, thought they were legit, and used them, um, which obviously that didn't result in anything good. So, you know, I think for me, it's first learning how to create you know, these prompts to use it so that you can use it effectively. Um, I love um, Jim's words to say it's not the panacea that, you know, and, I, and it's definitely um, at this point, or maybe it is gonna take over the world, but I, I don't see that from where I'm working. So yeah, so I'm in the learning phases and um, we'll talk some more. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, so what are the things that I think was a good, one of the questions that Charles was asked that I thought was a really good question was, what do we do in the classroom? A lot of the students, how do we know they're actually learning anything with more AI? You know, students are being bombarded when they go on TikTok with all these AI tools that say, hey, enter your homework assignment here and we'll just do the homework for you. How, how, do, we, how do we know they're actually learning anything? This is a really tough problem. And I, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's, it's something, even though I've, spend a lot of time using AI tools. It, it's, a, it's tough to figure out like what is good assessment. Like. How do we help students actually learn stuff that's valuable? Like what is valuable anymore? I think, I think these are all really important questions to ask and really important questions to think about. I've, I've been thinking about AI like nonstop over the past year and it's something that I still don't really have a good answer for. And it, it's taught me a lot of humility because when, whenever I talk to other faculty, Whenever I talk to uh, even staff that are working with AI, I'm, I'm constantly learning and being surprised by how people are adapting to AI in their context and how they're trying to make it work and they're, how they're trying to get student learning to make sense in this new age. Because it, it is a very challenging problem that I, I think it's going to take a lot of us putting our heads together to, to work through this. Hi. Um, I'm going to preface this with saying, you know, echoing what Roxanne said, AI is only as good as the user. And so a lot of students, if they're not explicitly trained on how to use AI in a way that's going to benefit them, they're not going to get the results they want. They may think they did. Um, I had a student who recently handed in a phone essay and it was beautifully written. Oh my goodness, I could not get over how well it was done. Um, but AI wrote about a completely different scene in the phone than the clip I had shown. Um, and the student didn't seem to notice that there wasn't an actual labyrinth in the scene at all and handed in the 
paper and with very much I used the notes that you put on Blackboard. I, I did this all myself. And said, That's amazing. So you're just saying a different way than me then. Um, <laughs> so I think you know there's that issue. Um, I've had students who have tried to write papers with sources, and often the sources are just completely made up. They're hysterical. You try to find them, they don't exist, the authors don't exist, the references don't exist. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, I've always been an early adopter of tools, and to me, this is just another tool. Um, I started filmmaking when it was on 16 millimeter film, because I am that old. Um, and so I see this as an opportunity to expand our skill set, expand the tools that we can use to make our jobs easier, and also for the students. Um, you know, I have a lot of students who struggle with, for example, writing a script. It's really hard for them to come up with the words that are catchy for a public service announcement. And now they can go to ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm making a public service announcement about this program in Middlesex. Here's the website. And suddenly they have this beautiful um, narration that they can talk into their project, which is what everybody's doing in the field. And I think that's also really important. Some fields are going to lend themselves to AI more uh, naturally. And communication and visual design are two of those fields. And they're already using AI. Um, I think of the entire Adobe suite at this point. I know Judy Perman's using a lot of the AI tools in Illustrator and Photoshop. I'm using them in Premiere. I use them in Lightroom. And so there's this real opportunity to teach the students how to use it well, to make the production of what they need to create faster. Um, but also, again, they have to be really careful because I've definitely had AI generate images for me that had a person with three eyes. So, you know, it, it, it's as good as the people. So I don't think I can do anything as, as fancy as some of uh, the panelists. But one thing that I've been doing consistently is looking, other than trying out some of these other, other things, um, is actually I've been reporting my class with student permission. And it started with the student accommodations. And I had to use this old-fashioned recorder. And I just said, I'll do it on my phone. Uh, and I do it with the transcription app. And then after I record the, the class, I can just create quick song of every class. So I post the recording for students, and then I have an outline of everything that we've done in the class. In addition to that, if I wanted to, I don't usually do this, but if I were to have a test or something like that, I can go back and say, create some test questions based on what we talked about in the class on September 9th. Um, and you can do that pretty quickly, and we can review that. So that's actually been really helpful. I think students can go back, they can re remember what we did in a particular class, and it's also helpful for me um, to, to plan ahead and, and to look back at the same time. Excellent points for everyone. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add to it myself, <clears throat> both from a, a staff and a, a faculty perspective, because I also, also work as an adjunct teacher in English. Um, uh, as Evan pointed out, I've participated in a number of talks in, in higher education around the use of AI. And um, in terms of trying to produce a, a positive outlook on it, there are two points that I'd like to make. One is that one of the biggest challenge of uh, working in education has been the volume of work, particularly the student work, and trying to manage it without having too many assistants. Um, and I kind of, you know, using AI tools to create assistance that help out with some of the, the drudgery work has freed up a lot of my time and energy, which I can then devote to my students, and I'm very appreciative for that. The second thing is, when I talk about AI, um, I'm often um, facing an audience like this, uh, where many of the people are over the age of 40, like myself, and who were more likely in um, college or graduate school in 1990, in which case I I invoke those memories of the introduction of the internet and World Wide Web, and I remind them how our elders in higher ed dealt with that. And I ask the question, do, who do you really want to go down the road again? I mean, seriously, it, looking back, it was real embarrassment how I responded to the World Wide Web. The one silver lining is, having had that experience once in a lifetime, we now know how to deal with our technology disruption in a little more constructive way, in a way that shows us that we're not as good. And What's more, um, there are those among us for whom this is the third disruption. And I see a, a show of hands from people who are in the math department. Okay. If you are in the math department, forget about the idea that. You remember the great calculator panic of the 1980s? Calculator was <laughs> destroyed. And it didn't. So this is their third rodeo. 
So if you want to get a little advice on coming down, talk to the now people. Um, so my next, the, the final follow-up question, again, I want to raise some of on this. What advice would any of you give to people who are just beginning to try out AI tools? Okay, so first of all, don't panic, right? Try it out. There's a lot of free tools out there. I've been using Quad AI, thanks to Jim, who suggested. He doesn't use things like all the rest of them, it's okay. Um, if you're gonna get started, it's like anything else, give it a try. And I'd like to, as, how many teachers are here? Just curious, right? Give me a show of hands. If you're teaching a class, first of all, thank you, right? Because you've taken this time, and this is not just, I mean, if you're a student, that's, I love that you're here, if you're a staff. But if you're teaching, I wanna talk to you just for a minute, okay. Think back to graduate school for a minute. You went there because you loved something about your subject, right? Find a way that connects that if you can, right? In your area. It's not your own interest, it's part of the professional development, but it's also with students. We don't want them using it to write essays, right? Again, go back to graduate school. I don't know about the rest of you, I've got, got two master's degrees, I know it's, it's the sickness. But, um, <laughs> but I remember the first one, I thought I was a pretty decent writer, and then I, I applied, I got in somehow, and then I finished my graduate, everyone's doing their thesis and saying, wow, I look back at my first semester's discussion boards and I said, wow, I was a whole boy, right? Compared to what I was at the end. So that's a skill. So maybe the thing to do is to sell, tell students, as we're teaching to use AI responsibly, we say to them, listen, there's a different advantage here, right? There is the fact that you're going to become a better writer, a better thinker, a better communicator. You're not just learning to write an essay, right? Like, it's not just about, like, here's my five paragraphs. It's, I'm becoming the person that I need to be, right? Like, I'm becoming a better person, right? So intellectually, at least. So that, think about that when you're trying to inspire them. It's like, you know, you got to that level. And then try to reach back to that interest that you have, right? And you love your subject somehow, find something again. Maybe it's an opportunity for you as you're exploring to find that love again, whatever it was. You know? and, and that's not just with the teachers either. Students, I hope you really, really love what you're doing when you find some area. It'll help motivate you, right? It'll help you build that deeper learning. And then the tools will be fun, right? And then you can play with them. You can try them. You can say, well, if I fail, I, I fail, I try again. You know, I hope that you know, you're confident in that. Right? Yeah, this is the big topic. This is the fun topic, actually, is how does it get used, and, and for, especially for education. And uh, the first thing is experiment, just go and experiment. So, for example, the other day I typed in uh, create a uh, Renaissance style drawing of Winnie the Pooh in digital art. And it, you know, I didn't like it at first. It was a bear, and then I didn't like that. I said it made it look more like Winnie the Pooh, but it wouldn't copyright it. And then, you know, it came back with what I like, of like a picture using Dolly from ChatGPT4 of this image. And I've created multiple images that I use for my PowerPoints, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, you, you, you know, for example, my daughter had to write a uh, 200, 250 word something on an application for summer job. She was like, you know, and I, so I typed it in and I gave it to her. And she's like, I can't use ChatGPT, I will not use it. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, you don't have to, but why don't you take a look at it and read it, because it will jog your memory on that book, Educated, that you read, because I know you read it several years ago. And um, she wouldn't, and that's fine, because it's very strict at um, high school not to use it. Um, but the point is, is that it can really give you back just some information or ideas, and that's a powerful thing. Now. If you're going to be asking a student to write a paper on Benjamin Franklin, yeah, it's going to write the best paper ever. And you won't have to do any of the work. But, you know, that's not really what we want to do. You want to, you know, engage them. And you can do this best by thinking, I don't really want them to, because they can get that information anywhere on how to write this paper on someone. But you want them to do the critical thinking piece, and that's where your expertise is so important. And the only way you're going to do it is if you practice, practice, practice. So last thing I'll say is, I asked, um, I said, create a career exploration assignment out of the box using an adventurous and in, uh, creative tone. And it gave me like eight different assignments. And one of them was, you know, you're on this vessel ship and you're collecting things along the way that, you know, interest you in your career. 
And I, and I read through each of them, and I was so impressed of the way it created something out of the box um, versus a, a assignment that I might do. So I think there's a lot of really good things in there. Um, and as you work in the tool more, you'll find that you can find things that you need. You'll, you'll figure it out. The last thing is, I just said that again, though. The last thing is, um, is LinkedIn. So LinkedIn Learning is where I've been um, looking at a lot of tools. And then ACU, um, Peter signed me up for an ACU course. I took that. And um, just attending sessions whenever you can. Um, I attended one from Oracle, two speakers on Oracle the other day. Um, and they said, the, someone asked, what is the biggest threat of AI right now? And they said, <laughs> people's reputations. So I thought, wow, OK, that's big. So meaning that we really need to like look at the content, don't enter your personal data, um, make sure you're reviewing it in that it's accurate. You need to be, still be an expert when using it. Those are great pieces of advice, advice Mark. And I think working on assignments uh, and connecting to Jim's point about like when you talk about your tech team about AI, I think those are all really crucial to like getting an interest in like what the affordances of AI are. Uh, one thing that I would recommend when using AI for the first time, and I, I, again, I, I would I would say just like I said to Jim, I, I, I would try using Claude. Uh, Claude allows you to upload PDF files. So if you have an assignment that you want to upload and tinker around with, it makes it very easy to mess around and change, tweak things around. Uh, another point that I would I would say is really important when starting off with AI is uh, to like talk to it like you would talk to another person, right? It doesn't have to be very mechanical. It doesn't have to be, well, I have to follow the specific formula to get the right outcome. Uh, when people see me talking to the AI, they're like, you, you talk to it like that? Like, there's typos of like, uh, not using correct grammar, run on sentences. And it, 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 it is able to parse that language and it's able to come out with good stuff. Uh, so I, I think when you're playing around with AI, uh, you don't need to be too formal. It can be pretty informal. Do something you're interested in, tweak an assignment that you really like, and see what it can do to it. Um, another thing that I've found people really like when, when starting off it with AI, and even if they don't really like the text generator tools, I've found that they like the tools that uh, can augment how they make content. Uh, one of the tools that I found people really like is this free tool by Adobe called Text or speech to animation. And essentially what it does is it allows you to like record like a short two minute like, lecture on a topic. And rather than using your face, it actually animates the little characters that you select. And the character will do all like the, the movements and shifting around. So I know a lot of people aren't comfortable recording themselves and putting up videos of themselves. So they find it really fun and kind of cool to use these animations of themselves speaking rather than just using their like Zoom face or something like that. So I guess those are just a few pointers that I would have for people starting off. I mean, I just, everybody's kind of said a lot of what I would suggest. Um, find someone who's using it and see if you can work with them. I think that's always helpful um, because otherwise you are going to spend time trying to figure out the tool and the best ways to use it. And I say the same to my students. You know, they, they need explicit instruction. They may think, oh, you know, we have this assumption that the younger generations are always more naturally suited to new technologies that they're going to understand them in a way that we don't, that they naturally adopt and adapt to them, but they don't. You know, we see this when we look at what they do on social media and broadcast their entire lives that people can then mine all their data, um, you know, things like that. And so this is sort of the same thing. They need explicit instruction. And so before you can give that, you really need to understand how the tools work yourself. Um, but I would also just try to reframe it as, you know, speaking conversation. I do that all the time as well. And a lot of times, you know, I'll tell students, have it generate research questions for you when you're writing a paper. Say, you know what, here's my topic. I'm stuck. What should I write about? And it will spit out some ideas. And it doesn't mean that they're going to take that exact research question. Maybe they will. And they'll write a great paper. But the things that I think students at this age find most difficult are really synthesizing information and finding a way to create a paper that is organized and really takes you through the progression of whatever research they've done. 
And so as chat GPT to then outline those papers for you. It doesn't mean you're going to use the exact outline, but it's going to get your brain thinking. And it's really no different than sitting down with a teacher or peer saying, you know, here's what I'm thinking about. Can you take a look at this? And so in that sense, it can kind of offload some of that work from us so the students are doing it before they even get to us. Um, so I would say, you know, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of the students using it in your class. Learn it, understand it, recognize that it's a tool that has a ton of use for. Um, and think about the skill that you're particularly trying to impart. You know, when I say that I allow my students to use ChatGPT to generate um, the voiceover for their commercials, I'm not looking for them to be commercial writers. They take media writing for that. That's a class where they need to generate that. When they're taking video production with me, what they need to know is how to use the camera, how to shoot quality video, how to color balance everything, how to then take it into a computer, edit it, and make a compelling video piece. Right? So think about what it is that you want them to learn and how ChatGPT or any of these other um, AI tools can actually help augment that learning as well. I don't know if I have a much position to give advice, but I, I like the the question about what it is that we want students to learn. And I, what I what I my observation about AI now is that the most important skill that we can teach them is the skill of discernment and to understand that they have a task that they need to complete. What tool do I need to with that, and then how do I do that? Um, and that, unfortunately, I think that's a skill that's one very difficult to teach, and two that a lot of our students that are coming in don't have that. Um, I know when I teach something, so let's say I teach them how to use a hammer, for instance, um, in week one, they'll try to use that hammer on every task that I give them. But then maybe I'll try to teach them to use a chisel, and then they'll use that for a little while. And um, and the skills that they need right now that all of us need to be a part of is to be able to see here's the task and then what are my options in applying that and honestly it, it's not I don't think it's going to be about the product anymore or what we want them to do it's about how they're how they're approaching it so my advice is give me advice on how to, to teach that <laughs> I love uh, Nick's last observation because it connects so well with something you may recall from Charles' presentation, which is a metaphor which he's used around the years, which is that ideally we're teaching students to use their minds like a Swiss army knife to figure out what tool they need for what task. Um, so that's a very nice, that's a very nice connector there. Um, one other thing I will recall, I think it was something that Charles said many years ago um, in regards to concerns about AI was when he was talking with the cousin of his about the concerns of AI. And his cousin said, I am less concerned with the dangers of artificial intelligence than I am with the dangers of natural stupidity. Um, so that, that was a nice way of putting things into context. And I think everything we've heard this morning has given us a very um, broad and thoughtful approach to this technology. And, you know, as you heard from the panel, we're still in the sandbox here. There's no one who has the big manual on how to use AI for a variety of things. So it's very exciting in that sense. We are writing the manual together. And this is part of that ongoing conversation which we're going to be having, uh, not just this month or the next year, but the next couple of years. And I think as an institution, we are uniquely suited to be part of that conversation and help others to have. So I want to say um, thank you to our panel. I want to ask everyone to give them a big hand. And a uh, few, just a few things before I, I let you go and, and first to the kind of influence that you want. This is the book that Charles and his team recently published. It's entitled Education in the Age of AI. Um, and again, I'm happy to obtain copies of the book for any um, faculty or staff member who wants a copy. Um, so that's one thing I want to point out. In terms of the sessions, um, for everyone who registered, you received an email last night with an email link to the agenda for the day and the sessions. I also put out some QR codes, um, which were um, wonderfully produced by um, our, our Center um, for Creative um, Marketing. And, and, and Mr. Wong, I think it's a nice shout out to you. 
for helping out there. You were, you know, I don't know how to do that. That's why I go to you for these things. So. Um, so again, uh, you will have to schedule, all of our sessions are either in the AR building or the Henderson um, building, um, so it's easy to find. I even had, thanks to Irene Luna facilities, um, some posters, although due to revisions in the schedule over the past 40 hours, there were two adjustments. But if you want to put a quick glance at a printed document that was scheduled, it's out there in the, in the, in the, uh, in the square. Again, um, I look forward to seeing you guys at lunch, it's right around 1225. And um, get up, stretch, and uh, enjoy the first session. Thank you all. Really appreciate it.